Scientists put a lot of effort into the classification and identification of microorganisms. And this is generally done using the science of taxonomy. With that science, um, this is classification and then also naming organisms based on characteristics that they share in common with each other. This science has been around for a little while. This was initially established by Carolus Linnaeus, and he published his system of classification in his book, which we call Systema Nature. Now there's two main guiding principles that are applied when we're using taxonomy. The first one is that there is going to be a hierarchical classification of species. So this is basically a layered classification of species. And then we're gonna follow this up with a two-part name or a binomial name for each organism. So let's talk a little bit about this hierarchical classification first. This is a look at how that would be used when we're talking about an animal example. And the same basic procedure would apply to microbes as well. So there is going to be a list of taxa, and that's what we see down this um, side over here. And these are all the different categories that we have that we're going to classify organisms in. It is a layered classification system, which is where that term hierarchical comes from. And if we just run through it, and look at the bottom tier first. On the very bottom of all of this, we have the kingdom that this particular animal that we're using as an example falls into. And our example animal here is just a typical cat. So the kingdom that that cat falls into is kingdom animalia. Now that kingdom, that layer is going to include every single animal that we do know of or that has been described. So that does include a lot of diversity, a lot of organisms that are really quite different from each other. And if you look down there, you can see that we have a cat um, and that's kind of right here in the middle. But then we also have things like human beings. We have earthworms there. There's a wasp. There's a snail, a starfish. So a lot of very different organisms. What we do with this layered classification system is that some of those organisms that share characteristics in common with each other, they will be moved to the next layer together. Or in other words, they will be placed into the same phylum. Now the phylum that contains the cat is what we call chordata. Um, there are certain characteristics that all organisms in that phylum share in common with each other. You can see that we have gotten rid of some of the most different organisms at this point. We've um, kind of weeded out all of the invertebrates like the um, wasp, the earthworm, the starfish. Those are all gone at that point. Now certain individuals within that same phylum, they will fall into the same class. The class that the cat falls into is mammalia. Mammalia is named for the presence of their mammary glands. So that is one characteristic that they do all share in common with each other. Um, they do have some other shared characters as well. Certain ones of those individuals will be in the same order. So the order for cats is called carnivora. And then certain ones of those will be inside the same family. And the cat family is called the felids. So I hope that one thing you're noticing is as we move through these layers, our groupings are getting smaller, they're getting more specific, and the organisms that you have within that group, they're going to share a lot more characteristics in common with each other. Within the cat family, we have the genus Felis, and then finally at the very top, we have the species name for the cat, which is Domestica. So for every identified, characterized organism, Scientists have gone through and they have determined all of the different taxonomic levels, which are the taxa, that that particular organism falls within. And when new data comes to light, these are reorganized a little bit so that we do have organisms within categories that share characteristics with each other. Now, if we talk more about that top layer, that species um, taxonomic level, Typically, species are defined as groups of organisms that interbreed, and then they're capable of producing viable, so living, offspring that are also going to be fertile offspring. That particular definition doesn't apply real well when we're talking about bacteria um, or other microbes. So with microbes, we tend to use the word strain to really describe the species. And a strain is going to be a population of cells that arose from a single progenitor cell. Okay, so that will be kind of our smallest group that we do identify when we are talking about microbiology. 
Now, if we talk about the second aspect of taxonomy, that was the two-part naming system. That two-part naming system is referred to as binomial nomenclature. So just the word binomial means two-part and nomenclature means name. And this is a very formal two-part naming system. As a formal two-part naming system, there are actual international rules and international guidelines that do apply when a new organism is identified and a name has to be established for it. The reason for this is that the binomial name is going to establish a specific name that is going to be used worldwide and really across all the different languages. So this means that regardless of what specific language that scientific researcher speaks, whether it's English or Spanish, Chinese, some other language, they will all use the exact same name when they are referring to a specific organism. So this will definitely help to facilitate the sharing of experimental data and research. That name that we get is going to basically come from the genus taxonomic level and then also the species taxonomic level. And it's gonna take those two names and it's going to combine them to represent the binomial name or scientific name of a particular organism. Here we have a few examples as they apply to microbes. Um, the first one is Haemophilus influenzae, so that is the flu. We have Escherichia coli there, which is E. coli. And then we have Enterococcus faecalis, and that is another bacteria. So again, all identified microbes and other organisms as well, binomial names have been established for them because the taxonomic levels that they fall within have also been identified and determined. None of this is really written in stone. Again, when new data comes to light that may show some different relationships among organisms, those taxonomic levels are reorganized so that they do reflect kind of true evolutionary history. At this point in time, most scientists have agreed on what we call the three domain system. The three domain system identifies three major branches of living organisms and two of those branches are going to be prokaryotes. So our two prokaryotic branches are right here, and that would be the bacteria and then also archaea. So those are made up of prokaryotic cells. And then we do have eukaryota, which is going to be our eukaryotic cell branch of this kind of overall tree of life that we have. Now this um, three domain organization system, this is based primarily on analyses of our RNA sequences. So based on ribosomal RNA sequences, now that's not the only data that's gone into this, but that's what most of it was established with. There's also other data that's used, and um, some of that is the type of membrane lipids that are found in these organisms, their sensitivity to antibiotics, so we don't want to say that the only thing that these organisms share in common with each other when they're placed into these groups are the ribosomal RNA sequences. They certainly do have other things in common too. So if we just look at how microbes are going to be classified, well, we can classify them based on some physical characteristics such as shape. That's kind of a starting point. It doesn't allow us to divide them up into too many individual groupings. So many times biochemical tests are going to be used as well, and those biochemical tests are going to test the ability of microbes to metabolize certain molecules. So it will test whether they're able to break down certain molecules or perform specific um, biochemical reactions. So when we run these types of tests, we can sample a large number of microbes at one time, and based on whether or not they're able to for perform a specific metabolic reaction, we may get a different coloration um, to the solution, and that allows us to divide them into different groupings. Another thing we can look at is we can do serological tests. These are going to test the ability of a microbe to trigger an immune response, and based on its ability to trigger an immune response, then we would place them into different categories or groups. If we look closer at the ability of microbes to trigger an immune response, if you look at the pictures at the bottom, we can see the microbes, which are the little blue spots, and then we also have the antibodies, which are the little red Ys right here. And if the antibodies are able to actually stick to the microbe, then we do get a positive result or we get that immune response. 
and you can see in the plates above exactly what that response is going to look like. So notice that the negative result shows pretty much no coloration and then the positive result is going to give us some darker appearances there that we can specifically identify. Phage typing is another way to classify microbes. Phage typing um, has to do with phage or bacteriophage more specifically. These are essentially viruses that infect bacteria. So we can group different microbes according to whether or not they are susceptible to a specific phage. So are they infected by a phage? The way that we look at this is that the phage, this bacterial virus, is mixed together with some bacteria and then we spread the sample on a petri plate and we look for growth. And what we see is that if they are susceptible to the phage, then the bacteria in that region of the plate are going to die off. And we do see that as plaques. So plaques are basically dead areas. They would indicate places where the phage was actually able to infect and kill the bacteria. And then the regions where we just see um, the bacteria itself kind of growing over the surface, those will be places that were not infected by the phage. The analysis of nucleic acids is also um, commonly used to identify similar groups of bacteria and different groups of bacteria. This one is um, relatively simple to use because we do have a lot of equipment that's able to extract DNA and analyze DNA sequences. So with these, we're basically determining the percentage of a cell's DNA that is guanine and cytosine. Guanine and cytosine are two of the four bases that do make up all organism DNA. And it's found that the percentages of G and C, they are relatively consistent between microbes that are very closely related to each other. A final thing that we can use to divide bacteria and other microbes into groups is we can use taxonomic keys. The taxonomic keys a lot of times are what we call dichotomous keys. And a dichotomous key means that basically we look at one characteristic and we decide based on that one characteristic, does our organism go in this group or does it go in this other group? And then once we split those groups off, we look at another statement and we decide whether it goes in this group or that group. So you can see in this image here, um, the different branching that we have with the dichotomous key. Basically, we can do the first test and determine, are they gram positive, yes or no? And then once we decide that no, they're not gram positive, we can look at the shape. And then based on shape, we divide them into two categories. And then if they're rod shaped, we can look at, can they metabolize oxygen, yes or no? And so we have a series of yes or no questions really that we go through that help us to separate the microbes into a lot of different groups. And these are um, keys that you could definitely use in a lab situation to help you identify which specific microbes you are actually studying.